Developing right now on Morning News Now, triple threat, smoke, fire, and record heat are setting off weather alerts for millions of Americans, plus another summertime storm threatening several states with heavy rain damaging hail and the possibility of tornadoes. We are tracking the conditions. Also this morning, rejected mixed reaction to a major ruling by the Supreme Court in a case that would have reshaped elections in America. While we would have liked to have seen, you know, just a just an outright uh, win on the case, we certainly understand what the U.S. Supreme Court, how they ruled on it. We'll break down the decision, the implications, and what happens next. This morning, the CDC is sounding the alarm after several cases of malaria are discovered within the U.S. for the first time in decades. More on that major headline. Plus, new research shows a shared deficiency of a critical mineral among millions of women. But doctors want you to know. And holiday getaway this morning. Millions of Americans are getting ready to travel for this long 4th of July weekend. That could mean long lines, delays, and cancellations. We'll get some pointers on how you can prepare before takeoff. Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. We begin this morning with the extreme heat that is stretching across the country with wide-ranging impacts. The dry conditions in the southwest are fanning a massive brush fire in Scottsdale, Arizona. Huge plumes of black smoke could be seen rising in the air as firefighters and air tankers battle the flames. So far, at least 2,500 acres have burned with more than 1,000 people forced to evacuate their homes. We're asking people to continue to stay out of the area. Uh, this is an active scene still. We're just asking people to be, you know, just patient with us. We're doing everything that we can. And smoke from Canadian wildfires is back. That is creating unhealthy air conditions for cities from Chicago to New York. The National Weather Service has issued air quality alerts for parts of Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. It says that poor air quality could stick around for a few days and spread into the Northeast. This is what it looks like in Chicago this morning. Take a look at that, that thick blanket of smoke obscuring the Lake Michigan shoreline. And in the South, the record heat is stretching into another day in Texas, and that is taxing the state's power grid. The dangerous heat indexes also expanding to Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. We have team coverage. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is tracking the conditions, but first, we begin with NBC News correspondent Sam Brock in New Orleans. Good morning. I am in downtown New Orleans right now on the banks of the Mississippi River, and it is already almost 90 degrees. The day has not even started yet. This is technically day two of what could be a five or six day extreme heat event here in New Orleans, maybe even longer than that. The officials locally are planning on raising the EOC status, the Emergency Operations Center, to a level three crisis moving into the weekend, which means there's going to be unified command calls. They'll have transportation at the ready to go into neighborhoods where people are potentially suffering and need to get out of the heat. I spoke with Mayor Cantrell yesterday here in New Orleans. She she said that one of the things they're really focusing on right now are those cooling and hydration centers. They had the blueprint, Joe, already put into place from Hurricane Ida. There was a heat advisory after that horrible event here. And they had the infrastructure established to help people when there was extreme heat, which is exactly what we're looking at right now. Complicating the matters is the fact that going into this weekend, the Essence Festival is going to be held here in New Orleans. That is hundreds of thousands of people packed onto the streets here as temperatures are easily going to approach triple digits. The heat index is expected to reach as high as 120 degrees. That's what it's going to feel like on the ground. So all of those issues coming together as throughout the region right now, millions of people looking at triple digit temperatures that goes really from Arizona and New Mexico across Texas to Louisiana where we are and then all the way out to Florida. As far as Texas is concerned, ERCOT, which is the operator of the electrical grid in that state, just announced yesterday unofficially that they had broken their all time record in June for daily usage. Now the electricity is flowing, but it definitely speaks to the fact that this heat wave has been unrelenting for weeks now. It's been days here in Louisiana, but weeks in Texas, and it just continues. While we are also seeing other effects of severe weather, this time from the north in Canada, all of that smoke coming from the wildfires is once again migrating to the United States and covering up landmarks from the Mackinac Bridge in Michigan yesterday to the city of Chicago, which saw over the course of the day its skyline in Lake Michigan suddenly shrouded in haze. The question now is all that haze moving to New York City. It could be there as early as today as the entire country straddling really all portions of it is dealing with some sense of severe weather. 
in New Orleans, Sam Brock, NBC News. Back to you. All right, Sam, thank you so much. Let's get more on the dangerous heat and poor air quality with your Morning News Now weather forecast. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is here. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, Joe. And yeah, we're going to continue to see that heat expanding as we go throughout the next couple of days. So we've been watching this for weeks and weeks. We're going to continue to watch this for at least through the weekend. 69 million Americans under some sort of heat alert, whether it's a heat advisory, a heat watch, a heat warning. The excessive heat warning is in that hot pink color. But notice California now also seeing some heat alerts. That's in the valleys where we're looking at a heat watch and also a heat advisory. But the advisory, as Sam mentioned, we're looking at anywhere from New Mexico all the way to portions of Florida and then moving north to parts of the Mississippi Valley into parts of the Ohio Valley. It is all due to this heat dome that's been taxed in place for the past few weeks, continuing to be tacked in place. It's going to start to move slowly and start to expand. So look at some of these numbers. 102 in Tulsa today. That's 12 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Lubbock once again into the triple digits as well. 105, 107 in San Angelo. Dallas 10 degrees above what is typical for this time of year at 103. And we're warm in Memphis as well. And then by tomorrow this moves off to the north and also the east. St. Louis the 100 degree mark. 12 degrees above average. Nashville 96, 100 degrees in Birmingham. And it's not just the south that's experiencing the heat as we go throughout this holiday weekend. We're going to see D.C. near 90 degrees on Friday, near 90 degrees on Saturday. Same story on Sunday. You factor in that humidity, it's going to feel warmer than that. So that's the heat story. Also talking about the air quality forecast, it is dismal in many, many spots. We have ozone concerns, Canadian wildfire concerns. So if you can, stay indoors, close your windows, spend as much time as you can inside with that air conditioner on. 87 million Americans impacted by it. Poor air quality today, especially where you see this red color. So throughout the Great Lakes, parts of the Midwest, and then extending into parts of the Northeast and also the Mid-Atlantic. That's going to be a story over the next few days. And look at some of these numbers. We're looking at a Des Moines that's one of the first uh, worst spots. Chicago was just terrible yesterday. Once again, we're going to see very poor air quality today. So we have the heat. We have the smoke. Now we have some storms that we're watching. Look at radar. Not too bad right now. We're not looking at extensive coverage of some storms, but still looking at radar where you see these brighter colors. That's where we're seeing the heaviest rain falling. So throughout portions of the Midwest into the Great Lakes, also parts of New England into the Northeast, we have two separate stories. We have an area of low pressure that's been kind of lingering over the northeast the past few days. It's continuing to do so today. So we're looking at lingering showers and storms in the northeast, parts of the uh, northeast as well. New York City, you could see some showers today. And then we're looking at the chance for strong to severe storms in parts of Minnesota into Wisconsin. Scattered storms roll through New England. Same story as we look at Minnesota, Wisconsin. We could see some hail, some really strong winds, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, and also the chance of an isolated tornado. This would be the likeliest spot just um, east of Minneapolis, where you see the yellow west of Green Bay, we're going to experience the chance for some hail, some damaging winds, and also a few isolated tornadoes. This is as we see tomorrow, we're looking at 18 million people at risk for a large hail, winds, damming, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. And this area kind of expands where you see that yellow. So portions of the Midwest, we're looking at Peoria, Chicago, Indianapolis, Louisville, and also Evansville. So we have a lot going on. We have heat, we have the air quality, we have storms, and this is just going to go on and on. The East Coast is holiday weekend looking pretty soggy. All right, that's not good. In some parts of the yeah. country right now, is seeing the storms and the smoke right now. So yep. they're getting a little mix of everything. All right, Michelle, thank you so sure. much. President Biden will be in Chicago today to deliver what the White House is calling a major address on the economy. The president plans to tout his economic record as he ramps up his reelection campaign. NBC News senior national political reporter Peter Nicholas joins us now with a preview. So, Peter, good morning. So the White House says this speech is going to focus on the president's vision for growing the economy. They're trying to give it a catchy name, Bidenomics. So what should we expect and why Chicago? Well, I think what we can expect is a recitation of the president's accomplishments. Uh, this is an election season. Uh, president will use this visit to talk about uh, investments he's made in infrastructure, um, in education. Uh, he'll talk about uh, job growth on his watch. So I don't think we're going to say anything new here. I don't think he's going to lay out new policies or new programs. This is uh, essentially uh, part of a tour that he's making and his um, surrogates are making around the country to try to tout and promote uh, achievements on his watch. Why Chicago? Well, um, Chicago is, I I Illinois is not a swing state necessarily. It's a solidly uh, blue state. Democrats do well there. But there is a lot of fundraising dollars to be picked up in Chicago. The president will be attending a fundraiser there. And so he's mixing a little bit, a little bit of business uh, with his speech, with uh, campaign fundraising work.
Yeah, clearly, this is all part of his reelection campaign. A recent NBC News poll shows President Biden's job performance really rating it's staying flat the last couple of months, not going up, not really going down. The economy and inflation we know have been top of mind for Americans this last year. Many are worried about their money. So can we expect this Biden Opex, Bidenomics message to be a major part of his argument for a second term? I think that's right. He has a lot of work to do on this front. Um, polling shows that um, most people actually believe Donald Trump did a better job when it comes to managing the economy uh, than Joe Biden. Um, there was a recent poll from the Associated Press that showed only 33 percent of the of adults uh, think Biden has done a good job managing the economy. So it's there's a disconnect between uh, how Biden is portraying the economy and how people are really living the economy in their day to day lives. Inflation uh, has been dropping, but still remains high. Gas prices are high. Uh, inflation was 9 percent last year. So people are not really feeling um, the impact, uh, the positive impact of what Biden says are his economic programs. They're not feeling that in uh, their daily lives. All right. Clearly, I still need to learn how to say Bidenomics. I'll work on it. Peter Nicholas, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Later today, Georgia's Secretary of State is scheduled to answer questions from federal investigators. It is part of a probe into former President Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. At the heart of this meeting is a recording from that now infamous phone call in January 2021, where the former president seems to pressure Georgia election officials to find more votes in his favor. NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley joins us now with the latest on what we can expect from this meeting today. So, Ryan, Brad Raffensperger is going to be questioned. We know many of those questions could focus on that phone call. We've heard it many times, but but what else could be included in this meeting? I think the context around the phone call is something that he could do a good job of explaining and just, you know, going through why it was so clear uh, that this was sort of a bogus made up thing that the, the president was looking for. And, you know, going into how he interpreted uh, the meeting itself and whether or not he felt pressured of the phone call itself and whether or not he felt pressured uh, by uh, the former president to, quote unquote, find, uh, you know, those 11,000 votes or so that uh, Trump uh, said he would need to. So I think, you know, it's obviously the phone call is the is the best evidence here. The recording is the best evidence. But, you know, there's certainly some context around it uh, uh, that he might be able to explain. Prosecutors, they could they actually need to call him uh, before a grand jury. So, Ryan, I mean, this investigation, we should be clear, is separate from the one that's being conducted by a special grand jury, which was appointed by the Fulton County District Attorney. Raffensperger testified in that investigation last year. What do his comments back then, and, and really the many comments we've heard from him publicly, what do they tell us about what he might say today? Yeah, I mean, he's told the story several times in several forums, so I think, you know, not a ton of surprises coming there. I think that the the difference between this this local uh, this local special uh, probe that's being run by the local prosecutors there, and of course the sprawling uh, federal investigation by Jack Smith's office is is just the broader context of it in terms of uh, you know Jack Smith's office has hauled a lot of people before that grand jury including called fake electors uh, from other states. Um, they also had a former Trump uh, campaign official who actually allegedly delivered those so-called fake electors to Congress the day before the January 6th uh, attack. So that's someone who's really the center of this. And I think it just shows you know, how wide this probe really is from uh, the Justice Department and Jack Smith looking at sort of every aspect of this running all the way from after Trump's election loss all the way uh, to and through uh, January 6th. So, Ryan, a charging decision in that Fulton County probe could come by the end of August. What is the latest there? Could those findings then have any bearing on this much larger federal investigation? Certainly, it's something that the feds are aware of. And I think, you know, the feds are going to be involved in any security measures around that decision if that comes in in July or in August. And I think that, you know, that's something that they're going to factor in. But uh, they're on separate tracks. These are just basically separate investigations. They have these separate charges, even though it's the same conduct at issue here uh, in, in some, you know, in, in, in some way. Um, these are completely separate charges and separate alleged violations or potential alleged violations of the law, uh, both on the state level and the federal level. So just different uh, charges that could be brought forward. And the conduct in the in the Jack Smith uh, in Jack Smith's probe is obviously much more uh, much more involved than just limited to what happened in Georgia alone.
All right, Ryan, appreciate your reporting. Thanks for joining us. Now, amid these investigations, the summer campaign season is kicking into high gear with the leading Republican presidential contenders taking part in dueling events in New Hampshire. That state is home to the first in the nation Republican primary. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard has the latest from the campaign trail. God bless New Hampshire and God bless America. Thank you. The battle for New Hampshire intensifying in the Republican primary. GOP frontrunners Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis hosting dueling events just 40 miles apart. He's holding an event right now to compete with us. There's only one problem. Nobody showed up. DeSantis at a town hall asking voters to move on from the drama surrounding Trump's 2020 defeat. If this election is about Biden's failures and our vision for the future, we are going to win. If it's about relitigating things that happen two, three years ago, we're going to lose. New Hampshire's first in the nation primary, a critical test for both candidates. We want to thank the people of New Hampshire. In 2016, we New Hampshire gave Donald Hampshire. Trump his first primary victory, helping lift him over a crowded GOP field in March to the Republican nomination. Seven years later, Trump's support in the Granite State still rock solid. A New Hampshire poll out shows Trump leading DeSantis in the state by 28 points. Somebody said, how come you only attack him? I said, because he's in second place. Well, why don't you attack others? Because they're not in second place. But soon, I don't think he'll be in second place, so I'll be attacking somebody else. Donald Trump! New Hampshire Republican voters we spoke to excited about the possibility of a second Trump term in the White House. But I love what he did. Why not Ron DeSantis? He became governor of Florida. He needs to finish that job, and I believe he still has time. You know, Trump needs to finish. He needs to finish this. And a candidate new to the campaign with an embarrassing air. Republican Miami Mayor Francis Suarez in a radio interview with Hugh Hewitt fumbling a foreign policy question about the Muslim minority group being persecuted in China, the Uyghurs. Will you be talking about the Uyghurs in your campaign? What, the what? The Uyghurs. What's a Uyghur? Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, let me, you won't be obvious. Okay. you got to get smart on that. Suarez releasing a statement to try and clean things up, saying, Of course, I am well aware of the suffering of the Uyghurs in China. They are being enslaved because of their faith. I didn't recognize the pronunciation my friend Hugh Hewitt used. That's on me. That was Von Hilliard reporting. Now, after the lunch, Trump then visited the home of his new campaign headquarters in the state. The New Hampshire primary will take place next February. As we await some major rulings from the Supreme Court this week, one ruling released yesterday is making headlines. Justice has ruled against giving state legislatures unchecked control over federal elections. It's a case that could have potentially upended state election laws across the country. In a 6-3 ruling, the justices decided not to side with North Carolina Republicans. They were pushing to empower state legislatures to set election rules with little to no oversight from state courts. It's known as the independent state legislature legislature theory. For more on this, we're going to bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, so help us understand what exactly, first of all, was this case all about? The Constitution appears to say that state legislatures are the ones that are in charge of handling and arranging and organizing state elections. So the argument here by one side was that that language in the Constitution makes it so that the state legislature makes all the decisions and it cannot be overturned by a state court or anyone else. That is unfettered power that is given to the state legislature by the Constitution. And therefore, should they choose to gerrymander, should they choose to draw districts the way they want to, nobody can stop them. Uh, the challenge there is that the same language in the Constitution, as you go a little further past that language, appears to imply that there is some federal and other outside role. So that's exactly what this case was about. And going forward, it means that state legislatures still have considerable power, Joe. They still have most of the power, so to speak, but there is some oversight. What exactly that is may still remain to be seen, but the lesson from today, from yesterday's decision, is that state legislatures do not reign supreme. They can be reeled in by a state Supreme Court. So let's delve a little deeper into this decision. What are the possible implications of it? Why is it seen as a victory for voting rights advocates? Uh, for exactly that reason. So, for example, if a state legislature wanted to draw the most ridiculous gerrymandered map that completely favored, for example, one race over another, one religion over another, in a way that had nothing 
nothing to do with geography, then the argument here would have been that, well, that's the state legislature. Maybe they were elected. That's how they got there. But the Constitution says they get to make that decision without any outside influence and nobody gets to review it. That may have been the direction had this case gone the other way. Almost from the outset, this theory was a bit, and that's the problem with the Constitution. It's written in that old-timey language, <laughs> and sometimes it causes us modern folks some confusion. So that's what the Supreme Court's for. This is democracy. This is the system working the way it's supposed to. The Supreme Court had to literally analyze the original document, the Constitution, and interpret it for us. Not a lot of hashtags in the Constitution. None. All right, I'm going to completely switch gears here while we have you. I want to talk to you about Kevin Spacey. This is happening overseas. The actor's in a London court this morning for the start of his trial. He's facing a dozen charges related to sexual offenses in the U.K., which he denies. Walk us through this case, the charges he's facing, and what the possible outcomes are here. There are four different victims. The charges range from 2001 to 2013, with some of the more recent ones only recently added in the last several months. But they're all being tried together in Britain. Now, Joe, I'm not a solicitor. I'm not a barrister. I do not wear a wig to court the way they do. But... In many ways, we borrowed our criminal justice system from our English neighbors. So there are a lot of similarities. One marked uh, uh, distinction is that we don't we have a confrontation clause that requires witnesses against us to appear in court. They don't quite have the same thing. So you may expect to see victims testify by remote maybe even with a barrier, uh, hiding their identity. But generally speaking, the process is pretty similar. You have the jurors, uh, you have a judge, and you have a criminal prosecution that would mostly look pretty similar to what we have. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you so much as always. Appreciate it. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, pack your bags and your patience. This 4th of July weekend is expected to be a busy one at airports. What you need to know before you head to your holiday weekend destinations. Up first after the break, a local lawmaker is now looking to be the first transgender member of Congress. She's going to join us to talk about her historic run and her message to voters. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're back with an alarming new report about the conditions inside one of America's most notorious detention centers. An independent United Nations investigator is calling for the U.S. to shut down Guantanamo Bay. She says detainees continue to face cruel and inhumane treatment. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber has the details. Cruel, inhuman, and degrading. That's how a scathing 23-page report from an independent investigator describes conditions at the United States' notorious Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. The suffering of those detained is profound and it's ongoing. The report's author, Finua Neolene, is the first UN independent investigator to visit the detention center since it was created 21 years ago. Part of her mission? Assessing the rights of detainees past and present at Guantanamo Bay. I received all requested access to former and current detention facilities. She reports that conditions have improved substantially since the first detainees were transferred. But she is still expressing serious concerns about what she saw during her visit. The Guantanamo Bay detention infrastructure entails near constant surveillance forced cell extractions, undue use of restraints, and other arbitrary and human rights non-compliant implementation. Guantanamo Bay opened in the wake of the September 11th attacks off the shore of the United States to house detainees of the George W. Bush administration's war on terror. We're getting vital information necessary to do our jobs, and that's to protect the American people. But many detainees never faced criminal charges. Its existence has faced backlash for years, from protests in the streets... We are not afraid! ...to the Senate. Guantanamo Bay is an international embarrassment to our nation, to our ideals. Then-Vice President Biden supporting his boss, Barack Obama, in his goal of closing the camp. Do you think that you'll succeed in getting Guantanamo Bay closed? That is my hope and expectation. Now, years later, President Biden still trying to make good on that expectation. In the last 21 years, nearly 800 men have been detained there. Now, down to 30. And according to the UN report, 19 have never been charged with a crime. 
Guantanamo Bay is and always has been a human rights disaster. Wells Dixon has represented Guantanamo detainees since 2005, including Majid Khan, who pled guilty in a military tribunal to terrorism-related charges and spent more than 16 years at the facility before being released earlier this year. Majid has described uh, his time in Guantanamo as death by a thousand cuts, arbitrary rules, uh, inconsistent rules, punishment for no uh, apparent reason, deprivation of rights, lack of medical care. The United States saying in a submission to the UN that it disagrees in significant respects with many factual and legal assertions in the report, but that it will review the recommendations and take appropriate action. A spokesperson for the State Department admitted that torture occurred at Guantanamo, but insists highly skilled and trained physicians are now providing care for the detainees. The special rapporteur said that we have not provided adequate rehabilitation to torture victims uh, at Guantanamo. Uh, I would say we are sensitive to the unique medical, uh, including physical and psychological needs of the individuals uh, who remain in detention at that facility. As for Dixon, he says Guantanamo Bay never should have opened. My hope is that the Biden administration studies very carefully the findings and conclusions of this report and takes them to heart. And if the administration does that, then I am confident that it will be able to close Guantanamo. Our thanks to Ellis and Barber for that report. NBC News reached out to the White House for comment, but was directed to the State Department for additional questions about this specific report. As you just heard, President Biden has previously said he wants to close Guantanamo, but there is no plan to do that at this moment. International headlines now, starting with new developments on that short-lived rebellion in Russia. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us with the latest on that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yes, the founder and leader of the Wagner Group, Eugenie Prigozhin, is now in Belarus, at least according to the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. Lukashenko also said that Wagner mercenaries were offered an abandoned military base if they want to join their leader. This comes just after the Wagner Group's short-lived Russian rebellion that's raising questions about Putin's leadership. Now let's head over to southwest China, where flash flooding triggered landslides that killed several people just yesterday. At least three are still missing and more than 900 people have been evacuated. China has been experiencing extreme weather these last few weeks, including heavy rainfall in the southern regions and a record-breaking heat in Beijing. And we end this short tour of the world in Canada, where some couples are taking date night to a new level. These husbands are on the move with their wives in tow, competing in the so-called wife carrying contest. Husbands strap their wives to their backs and actually run through an obstacle course. Some of the couples have had a competitive edge, finding creative ways to carry their partners to the finishing line. Now, this kind of competition is a Finnish tradition originating around the 18th century. And get this, all for, it's all for one free beer, which I'm sure they're going to use to wash down some pain relief medication because <laughs> that looks like, you know, the recipe for back pain. I mean, they should get at least two beers, Claudio, at least two beers for all of that. <laughs> <right>. Yes. <laughs> right. What about the wife? Yes. Exactly. No kidding. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Turning now to Delaware, where one local lawmaker hopes to make history becoming the first openly transgender person to be sworn into Congress. Her name is Sarah McBride. She currently serves as state senator and is the highest ranking openly transgender elected official in the country. She's now running for a spot at the federal level in the House, hoping to fill the seat of Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester. McBride announced the launch of her campaign on Monday, and she likely won't be the only one vying for that seat. We have State Senator Sarah McBride. McBride joining us now to talk more about all this. Senator, good to have you with us. You are no stranger to being the first of anything in Washington. In fact, back in 2012, you were the first openly transgender person to work at the White House as an intern for the Obama administration. What have these experiences taught you and what would it mean to be the first openly transgender member of Congress? Well, first off, good morning. It's great to join you. Uh, those experiences from working in the White House to speaking at the Democratic National Convention in 2016 to now serving as the first openly transgender state senator in the country have demonstrated me the power of proximity, that if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. Democracy only works if it includes all of us. We only have a healthy democracy if all of us have a seat at the table. 
But ultimately, what I have seen throughout my career is that none of that matters if I also don't just do the best job possible in that role. When I worked at the White House, when I served as an advocate, now as a state senator, the only way to ensure that while I may be the first, that I'm not the last, is to be the best member of Congress that I can be. Because I'm not running to be the transgender member of Congress. I'm running to be Delaware's member of Congress who's focused on all of the issues that matter to people of every background up and down this state. Senator, you're running at a time when anti-LGBTQ legislation is reaching a high in many states around the country. How worried are you about this backlash, especially being in this higher profile race? There's no question that progress has never been linear. It's always two steps forward and one step back. And we are without question facing an unprecedented attack on the LGBTQ community, particularly the most amazing but vulnerable members of our community, trans kids. Ultimately, these are wrong and unconstitutional, these policies, but they're also cruel solutions in search of a problem. Um, these are an effort, these policies, these attacks are an effort by MAGA Republicans to distract from their complete lack of agenda for working families and their policy failures over the last several decades. And so they're trying to distract from, from those realities by targeting young people. Ultimately, though, what I've seen throughout my career, what I've seen running for office here in Delaware, what I've seen campaigning for Democrats up and down the state, is that voters aren't interested in attacks on kids and families. In fact, they're pretty repulsed by them. Vo voters are interested in what candidate will deliver for them, what candidates focus on the issues that matter to them. That's how I won in 2020. That's how I won re-election in 2022. That's how I'll be campaigning, focused on the issues that matter, like early childhood education, affordable health care, gun safety, reproductive rights. These are the issues that I hear from voters. And Republicans can go talk about the things that Stoke culture wars, but ultimately that might appeal to a small base. It's not going to appeal to voters. Is there something you could do if elected at the federal level that would address some of this legislation that has been passed locally, especially the things that impact trans kids and restricting their gender affirming care? Sure. So in addition to all of the priorities that I'm running on from early childhood education to paid leave to gun safety, we could also in Congress pass the Equality Act. Legislation actually helped write back in 2015. The Equality Act would add gender identity, sexual orientation, and where it's not currently included, sex to our nation's federal civil rights laws. That kind of uh, policy would guarantee that what we're seeing at the states aren't just potentially illegal under federal law, but definitively illegal under federal law. Uh, and I would look forward to adding my name as a co-sponsor to that legislation should I get elected. You are a Delaware politician, so no surprise you have a history with President Biden and his family. Do you see that as something that could impact your campaign at all? Well, first off, we are so proud of Delaware's own Joe Biden here in his home state. He has done an exceptional job as president. I'm proud of my relationship with him, my friendship with him. I'm proud to have worked alongside him and his son, our late Attorney General, Beau Biden, to advance uh, policies for not just the LGBTQ community, but so many people, vulnerable people across this state. Um, I'm looking forward to supporting him and in his reelection campaign. And certainly we'll be talking about the same policies uh, in his campaign and my campaign, the policies that impact working families, policies that protect a woman's right to choose, policies that keep our kids safe through gun safety measures. We'll have a very similar message, I think, as we move forward into 2024. And uh, I think Delaware is ready to make history by electing, re-electing Joe Biden, electing Lisa Blunt Rochester to the United States Senate, and hopefully by electing me to the U.S. Congress. All right, State Senator Sarah McBride, thanks for taking time to join us this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Coming up, growing concern about a mosquito-borne disease after several cases are confirmed for the first time in decades. What doctors want you to know. Plus, the best medicine, the new research that shows a little laughter can go a long way when it comes to your mental health. This is Morning News Now. We're back with a warning from the CDC as cases of malaria are detected in Texas and Florida. So far, the agency has documented five cases. This is actually the first time the disease has spread here locally in decades. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren reports. 
Calling malaria a medical emergency, the CDC says the cases were hundreds of miles apart, four in Florida and one in Texas. No evidence to suggest they're related, but what they do have in common is no link to travel abroad. The last time malaria was transmitted locally in the U.S. was 2003. The CDC says mosquito surveillance and control have been implemented. Malaria isn't contagious, but the parasite that causes it is transmitted by certain mosquitoes. Physicians are not going to be thinking about malaria in someone who has not traveled. If the fevers persist and if they can't find another cause, it should be considered. Fever, chills, headaches and fatigue are the most common symptoms. The recent cases were Plasmodium vivax, the less severe form. And while the CDC considers the risk of locally transmitted malaria low in the U.S., it warns of increased danger with the rise in international travel this summer. And many doctors worry climate change could make things worse. The warm temperatures are important uh, for the mosquito population and will give rise to a larger population. The CDC urging a plan for rapid access to IV artisanate, the first-line treatment for severe malaria and limiting mosquito bites by covering up, using repellent, and draining standing water, which serves as breeding grounds. The latest patients all reportedly recovering, but the CDC wanting everyone from physicians to the public to pay attention. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News. It's time for your weekly medical checkup, and this week we are diving into a new warning about iron deficiency affecting millions of young women, plus how reading for fun as a child can boost your brain as a teen. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now with these health headlines you may have missed. Good to see you. So, so let's start with this new research shows almost half of young women in the U.S. have low iron mm -hmm. levels. Why is that? What can they do about it? Yeah, so the numbers are, are pretty striking, Joe. So 40 percent of girls between the age or women between the ages of 12 and 21 were found to be iron deficient. Six percent of them were actually noted to be anemic from the iron deficiency. And this is important because low iron, of course, we know can cause fatigue and headaches, chest pain, and current screening guidelines are missing these cases because right now there are no recommendations to screen for anemia or iron deficiency in this age group. Normally we screen little kids, we will screen pregnant women, and this is super, super important. So my doctor's orders are this. Um, if you are, well, first of all, I, I should say also as a parent, if you're concerned that your daughter might be anemic because they look a little pale or they're feeling tired, please go and have them checked out. You can definitely Definitely lean to um, iron rich foods. You can think leafy green vegetables, meats, of course, chickpeas, and you can also take a supplement. But I think this is a real wake up call, Joe. You know, we don't have, as I said, formal guidelines for screening for iron deficiency in this age group, and I think that this could theoretically be practice changing. All right. I'm going to switch gears now to a, a research I love. It's a yes. study that shows a little bit of laughter can go a long yes. way. Humor therapy yes. could lessen our symptoms of anxiety, of depression. What counts as humor yes, therapy? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> what counts as humor therapy? Well, a couple of things can. So some things are direct, right? Like you watch a funny video and you're going to laugh. Medical clowns, for example, especially for pediatrics. We're talking about magic tricks, puppets, juggling. And then there's something called laughter yoga. <laughs> I had to look that you're laughing. See? I, it worked. It worked. No, I had to look this up. I was like, are you in like Shavasana and laughing? Are you doing downward dog and laughing? No, but it's like a group sort of meditation, breathing exercises. And they do this like voluntary laughing that then becomes contagious. Wow. I know. I kind of want to do that. I know. And so this is what I like about it. The doctor's orders here are also, I think, pretty straightforward. Is this going to be a substitute for medical therapy if you need to be treated for depression or anxiety? Maybe not, but as an adjunct, as part of complementary and alternative medicine, absolute, absolutely, right? I mean, there's absolutely no harm. And especially for young kids and for older people for whom antidepressant medications are either inappropriate or not indicated, this could be something really, truly wonderful. And you can Google online, laughter yoga, you, you can do it. Here's the deal, if you watched me do yoga, you would yeah, laugh. So exactly. see, it's like, there you go. it's an all-in-one inclusive win. there. All right, <laughs> let's talk about this thing we teased. It's that kids who read for yes. fun may be better off as teens. This yeah. isn't surprising, but it's good to hear, right? <laughs> I, well, it's good to hear unless you're a parent who's like, I know my kid needs to read, so I'm gonna, we're gonna put this in the bucket of, 
we're going to make parents feel stressed out even more that their kids should be reading more. But yes, so this study looked at kids who read voluntarily for pleasure starting early between the ages of like two and nine. How did they fare as adolescents? And what they found was that they did perform better cognitively on verbal skills and memory, but they also had better mental health. Again, not necessarily surprising. The optimal time, the optimal amount of reading was about 12 hours a week, which oh, is wow. two hours a day. Yeah. That means doctor's orders. Get your kid into a summer program, right? Or, or I mean, we used to have this as, I don't know if you had this when you were little, we had like a reading, mm -hmm. um, like, a reading you know, like a syllabus yeah. or, oh, you know, oh, yeah, okay. that we had to do, but, yeah. and also be a role model, which also means moms, dads, Put your device down, pick up a book yourself with pages because your kids will definitely model that behavior. So it's good news, and I don't want to stress parents out. We kind of knew this was true, but it's another reason to try to like, make, you know, time to change. Exactly. Make reading the cell phone doesn't, count. doesn't we, count. We've seen these recent, you know, research that shows kids are reading less for fun. Yes. So we just got to try and get them to read more for fun. Exactly. All right, Dr. Azar, thank you so you much. Bet. Always appreciate it. Coming up, fireworks and frustration. This 4th of July weekend could mean a big headache for millions of travelers. We're going to get some tips on how you can navigate the busy holiday crush at the airport next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. We are just days away from the long 4th of July holiday weekend. That means pools, barbecues, and for some, long lines at the airport. Summer travel is expected to rev up this weekend. And if you're planning to take to the skies, the more prepared you are, the better. Who better to help us prepare than travel expert Mark Elwood? He joins us now. Mark, good to see you. So we all remember what happened last year, whether you were experiencing it or you saw it on TV. Long wait times, massive delays. Do we know, first of all, what the airports and the airlines are doing to make sure we do not relive that again this summer? They're doing their best. They can't control the weather. We saw terrible weather in the Northeast this week. They have ramped up their staffing. And remember, a lot of the delays last year were uh, still a pandemic holdover. They didn't quite have the airports back to pre-pandemic staffing levels, operational levels. They're much closer now. So fingers crossed, we should be in a pretty good place. So how about the passengers? What can they do? What can we do to make the trip as smooth as possible? We can, we can contribute, absolutely, I love that you asked that. Remember, packing is crucial. That TSA checkpoint is a real bottleneck. And I wanna remind people, when you're packing, take the bag you're gonna travel with, turn it upside down and shake it. Make sure there's nothing in there that might get you in trouble at the TSA, a blade, whatever. So take it and make sure it's an empty bag. And remember, Joe, I know you know this, the 311 rule, right? You know that? Yes. Which is three ounces of liquids, one quart per person. If anything is a li little liquid, liquid gel, aerosol, you've got to have three ounces max if you want to carry it on board. Do not forget that. Do not turn your suitcase upside down and shake it if it's already been packed. Only do it when it's empty. All right. <laughs> is that just what? <laughs> That's my tip. That's all I got for you. All right. Finally, between the weather, the oversold flights, the worker shortages, we do know delays are going to be inevitable in some places. So what are some tips to make sure that you can get where you want to go if you are experiencing a delay? Look, I know. And remember, even at the TSA or, de or dealing with the staff, remember, it's not their fault. A lot of pleasantness will go a long way. Remember that saying you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. But I would encourage you to mention the words interlining, which is really air airline speak for making nice. If your airline has an agreement with other airlines, it means that they, they will be able to put you on a rival carrier to your destination sooner than one of their flights might get there. So do always ask, are there any interlining agreements? Because that might be the difference between being in the airport for eight hours and getting a flight in maybe 90 minutes. And I feel like they would be so impressed if I said the word interlining to them. Very cool. Mark Elwood, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Have a great holiday weekend. Pleasure. That is some financial news. Microsoft's CEO is headed to court today to defend the company's recent multi-billion dollar acquisition. CNBC's Silvana Hinao is interlining with us. She joins us now with that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. 
Okay, Joe, good morning. All right, let's get to some business headlines. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella is scheduled to appear in court today to defend the company's nearly $70 billion takeover of video game maker Activision Blizzard. The Federal Trade Commission is seeking to block the deal, claiming it would hurt competition by unfairly boosting Microsoft's Xbox console. Microsoft has said the deal would benefit the industry by making Activision's games like Call of Duty more widely available. The hearing could make or break what would be the most expensive acquisition in the tech sector's history. Booking.com is testing a trip planner that's partially powered by what else? ChatGPT. So the tool, which is available starting today, will let select travelers ask questions and create itineraries. And it will also rely on Booking's current machine learning models to provide options for destinations and accommodations. Rival Expedia launched a test version of its new ChatGPT travel planning experience back in April. And Ford shook up the electric vehicle market when it launched the F-150 Lightning a few years ago. The truck attracted a lot of interested customers because it was affordable. The base model back then started at just under $40,000, but after four price hikes, that same model now starts at around $62,000, and well, that's turning off some buyers. The Verge reports the F-150 Lightning has become too pricey with customers canceling their reservations or buying some Something else. Ford has cited higher costs for materials and supply chain issues for those price hikes, Joe. All right. There Savannah. certainly is a lot out there on the market, so there's options out there. All right. Yes, there are plenty. It's a, it's a booming industry. All it right, sure Savannah. Is. Thank you so much. Appreciate you it. You got it. Coming up, centuries of culture on display. When we come back, we're going to take you to Ireland, where there's a new push to keep the country's art scene alive. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. The stars who will be added to the Hollywood Walk of Fame next year have been revealed. And a touching tribute, the late Chadwick Boseman, who died in 2020, will receive a posthumous star. And Michelle Yeoh, who won an Oscar for the hit Everything Everywhere All at Once, will also be honored. The Hollywood Chamber of Commerce announced it was honoring 31 entertainers in all, with actor Kerry Washington and musicians Gwen Stefani and Dr. Dre also making the cut. Congrats to all of them. You can't visit Ireland without soaking up centuries worth of culture, but now a new pilot program funded by Ireland's government is helping to keep the arts alive by paying people to make art of all kinds. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald reports from Ireland. The small country of Ireland is known for many things, from its rolling hills to coastal views and Guinness, of course. But it's art at the center of its vibe. Just listen to this group playing in a local pub. During the pandemic, like many industries, the arts took a major hit. So in a groundbreaking initiative, the country is taking matters into its own hands. They're trying to revive their creative industry. In a new pilot program, the Emerald Island is paying artists to create, no strings attached. It's been hugely transformative to my practice. It's meant that I was able to quit the part-time job that I had working as a receptionist and now just devote my time to my art practice and be in the studio. Eleanor O'Donovan will tell you she had an incredible stroke of luck. She's one of 2,000 artists from various disciplines like visual arts, music, dance and theater who were randomly chosen to participate in a three-year trial. I like, can't imagine not doing it, but it's also like a job. It is a job for me to be able to work and I do consider it work, uh, what I do. And, you know, I take the time to go to work and come to the studio and make art. She can't solely survive on the 17,000 euros given, but it pays her for the time she dedicates to creating. In other words, it's giving her some stability. This money needs the support, but also it would be... Declan Jordan is a professor of economics at Cork University's business school. How do you then address people who might take advantage of the system? There are always people who milk any system that you set up. The evidence from other pilot schemes shows that that's not what happens. When you give people money, they actually do good stuff with it. They want to spend it. They want to invest in themselves. Jordan says that investing in themselves is an investment in Ireland. We tend to use our art we tend to use our artists, our music, our storytellers, our filmmakers um, as part of the story you know, to attract uh, in people um, to invest in the country. Since the program launched in September, the extra time to create has allowed Eleanor to find a new medium. 
I'm working on a film now at the moment as well. I'm doing a, an exhibition in Dundee in Scotland next month and the film is kind of the centrepiece of the exhibition. Um, it's a short film, I've never made a film before, um, but it's been really exciting. A small country with a big investment while hoping to paint a new vision for the world. Megan Fitzgerald, NBC News, Cork, Ireland. That does it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. Right now on Morning News Now, trouble in the skies. It has been a turbulent lead up to one of the busiest travel weekends of the year. Already thousands of frustrating delays are plaguing packed in passengers at some of the nation's largest airports with days to go before the big rush hits. The airline industry says wild weather is partly to blame, impacting major airports along the East Coast. Well, in the South, millions are bracing for another Another scorcher of a day in the Midwest and Northeast are dealing with more smoke and smog from those Canadian wildfires. We're covering it all from coast to coast. Also this morning, standing trial. Actor Kevin Spacey arrived in a London courtroom today for the start of what's expected to be a weeks-long trial over a dozen sexual offense charges. We'll take a look at what to expect as the case plays out. Also, fresh fallout this morning over that potentially damning audio recording of former President Trump allegedly discussing a classified document with staffers and writers. The former president now insisting that conversation was illegally leaked. More on Trump's heated remarks to potential voters in New Hampshire in just a moment. And later this hour, we're flipping the script with a quick-witted comedian who has not only embraced her disability on stage, she makes it part of her act. First, we begin with severe weather conditions stretching across the country. In the southwest, a supercell tore through Oklahoma yesterday, bringing rain, hail, and high winds. It left a lot of damage in its wake. And in other southern states, an ongoing heat wave is threatening to put a damper on 4th of July celebrations. Dangerously high temperatures are creating unbearable conditions for people from Texas to Miami. And severe weather is blamed for flight frustrations at our nation's airports, caused major backups yesterday with more than 2,000 flights canceled. That comes as airlines are gearing up for what's expected to be a busy 4th of July weekend. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello is at Boston's Logan International Airport with more. Yeah, good morning from Boston, Logan. We've already had a ground stop here this morning because of heavy rain. And the FAA is warning we could have ground stops in the New York City area again today. Miami, Orlando, Minneapolis, San Francisco. That means it could be another very rough travel day after 2,200 flight cancellations yesterday. The bottom line, if you're traveling today, it could be a rough day. Wednesday morning in the nation's airports. We've been here for a day and a half. A less than ideal lead up to what's expected to be the busiest time to travel this summer. This entire thing is the United Line. Along the East Coast, long lines at some of the biggest hubs with passengers facing thousands of delays and cancellations. We've been here for like, been here for like 10 hours. <laughs> Among the most impacted, New York's three airports, JFK, LaGuardia, and Newark. This is inhumane. It's actually passenger abuse is what it is. High school classmates Cheryl Giamo and Joe Tanner spent the weekend in Long Island at their 40th reunion. They opted for a 26-hour train ride back to Florida after their Sunday flight home was canceled. It turned out to be an invention for us. We'll be talking about this at the 50th reunion. The airline industry says an air traffic control shortage is partly to blame. The CEO of United, which has its own staffing issues, says the FAA failed us this weekend. But overnight, United requested the FAA order a temporary ground stop for its operations at Newark so the airline could catch its breath after becoming overwhelmed. Still, the FAA is facing 2,500 controllers retiring this year and last, and a timeline of up to three years to train and certify new controllers. Yeah, we appreciate you flying with us, appreciate your patience. Volatile summer weather is always the wild card, and thunderstorms could be a possibility heading into the long holiday weekend, where AAA says, we could see nearly 51 million people on the country's skyways and highways. What people can expect when they're on the roads, whether on the air, whether at the gas station, wherever they are, is a lot of company. <laughs> we have never had a forecast 
like this one. For the vast majority who will travel by car, good news at the pump. Gas prices are more than a dollar cheaper compared to last year. And Hopper says car rental prices and domestic round trip airfares are also down. Back here, Boston Logan. If you're traveling today or over the coming days, check with your airline's app regularly to see if your flight is, in fact, delayed or canceled because of this moving weather system across the entire country. Again, 2,200 flight cancellations yesterday and already today. Cancellations and delays are growing by the minute. Back to you. All right, Tom, thank you so much. Let's get right to NBC News correspondent Sam Brock in New Orleans with a look at what's happening on the ground. Sam, good morning. Yeah, Joe, it's already sweltering. New Orleans is basically the epicenter of this regional heat wave as the city officials here have activated their emergency operations center to crisis level, Joe. That is to address the possible challenges of a heat index that is once again expected to push 120. And Louisiana is hardly the only state that's suffering. This morning, millions of people across the country waking up to scorching triple-digit temperatures. I wish I could tell you I'm used to it after 45 years, but I'm not. It's still hot. With the heat wave now in full effect, the National Weather Service saying it's essential to limit your heat exposure. Local leaders also quickly ramping up cooling centers, transportation, and check-ins, especially in New Orleans, which is facing record heat levels. This is unprecedented. We know that the city of New Orleans has been on the front lines of climate change. This is yet another example of that uh, extreme excessive heats that we've never experienced before. The sizzling conditions spreading to many other cities, too, including Houston, where triple digit temps buckled roads and the electrical grid in Texas breaking its all time daily usage record for June. Trying to stay hydrated and stay in the shade as much as possible. To the north, Canadian wildfire smoke once again impacting air quality in the U.S. Both Chicago and Detroit were rated the worst air quality in the world on Tuesday. That choking smoke expected to arrive in New York as early as today. While in Turpin, Oklahoma, a possible tornado tearing through this barn is threatening supercell clouds, producing wind gusts topping 100 miles an hour. A stark contrast to this extreme heat that has some questioning whether it's even worth going outside. I will not be leaving my house unless I absolutely have to. I mean, it's 100 degrees is unbearable. Officials here in New Orleans, Joe, are planning on the heat to stick around at this level for at least another five and six days, five or six days, I should say. And to add insult to injury, we've also just learned this morning about a precautionary boil water advisory that's gone out for a couple of neighborhoods here in New Orleans after the pressure in a water main started to drop. So now there's a certain community or a couple of communities in the area, Gentilly and New Orleans East, where they have to worry about their water and the heat. Joe? Boy, the problems keep multiplying. All right, Sam, thank you so much. Let's get a closer look at your morning news now. Weather forecast. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us. Michelle, we keep saying uh, no relief in sight, no relief in sight. Is there any relief in sight? <laughs> the no relief in sight. I'm so sorry, Joe. I know this is going on and on. It's all due to this area of high pressure that's parked in place, and it's really not budging. It's actually going to move a bit. It's going to keep that heat in place in the south, but also kind of grow and bring some places that haven't seen this extreme weather into place. So we're looking at portions of the upper Mississippi Valley that could see some really uh, warm air this weekend. So these are the big weather stories today. As Sam mentioned, the record heat in the south, once again, into the triple digits. We're going to add California into the mix as we go throughout the next couple of days especially the valleys of California. We're going to be soaring into the upper 90s, the 100s as well. Also watching the chance for severe storms in portions of Minnesota, also Wisconsin. I'll show you that in just a minute. We're concerned about air quality in the Midwest, the Great Lakes into the Midwest, uh, the Northeast also, uh, Mid-Atlantic. And we're also looking at the chance for some storms in southern Florida and also in New England. So a lot going on once again today. We're looking at heat alerts stretching from portions of the Southwest into the South Central states, the Southeast, all the way up to portions of the Mississippi Valley. Valley. And then notice California, as I mentioned, looking at heat watches, heat advisory, especially Thursday and Friday there. So 69 million Americans baking over the next few days. And this is going to last into the holiday weekend. Excessive heat warning for Dallas, Memphis, Jackson, Birmingham, also New Orleans. That's where we're seeing temperatures into the triple digits once again. Heat indices so high, as Sam mentioned. Monroe, you're going to feel like 116 today. Little Rock feeling like 110. New Orleans feeling like 113. And Montgomery, you're going to feel like near 100 degrees as well. As we go through the week, 
weekend, we're looking at temperatures in Memphis over the 100 degree mark, 103. On Friday, Saturday, looking at 100 degrees. That's the air temperatures. So the heat does continue. I wish I could say something else about that. I'm also looking at portions of the Midwest, the Great Lakes, and the Northeast with some area uh, air quality concerns today as well. Joe? All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Sure. This morning, Kevin Spacey appeared in a London courtroom. The Oscar winning actor is standing trial for charges related to sexual offenses allegedly committed against four men in the UK between 2001 and 2013. Spacey denies all the charges. NBC News correspondent Ali Aruzi joined us now from London for more on all this. So, Ali, we understand the trial officially kicks off on Friday. What came out of today's session? Uh, th that's right, Joe. The, the trial starts on Friday. Today was a jury selection. Uh, the two sides sat there and they decided what jury members they were going to uh, decide for the case. And one of the reasons for that is that the case is not happening tomorrow is because there's such a huge backlog of criminal cases in this country. And that's why it's taking a bit longer to start than was expected. So it is going to start on Friday and it's expected to last at least uh, four weeks, possibly longer. The judge made a few recommendations at the initial stages of the hearing. He even selected two extra jurors because he said uh, that the 12 jurors that were on there that had to fill out a form, that they had to uh, uh, say that they had no connection whatsoever to this case, to the movie industry that's involved in this case. And in case at some point during this trial, it does transpire that they are connected to the case, even in a very loose way, you have those two spare jurors to take over. So everything will stay start on Friday. So, Ali, tell us more about the charges. What exactly is Spacey being accused of here? We know he's denied the charges, but what's the punishment he could face if he's found guilty? That's right. He's uh, facing some uh, pretty serious uh, charges, Joe. He's facing uh, seven counts of uh, sexual uh, assault, um, three uh, counts of, of, of assault, and the two last ones are, are the most serious ones. Um, Engage, making, forcing somebody to engage in sexual activity without their consent and forcing somebody to engage in penetrative sexual activity without their consent. Now, the, the, the punishment could range from a hefty fine for the, for the least heavy of defenses. And the last one I mentioned could face a 19-year prison sentence. All of this will transpire over the course of the next four or five weeks. All right. Ali Aruzi in London. Ali, thank you. The Marine veteran accused in the subway chokehold death of Jordan Neely is set to face a judge for arraignment today. Daniel Penny was indicted by a grand jury earlier this month, but according to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, Penny's exact charges were to remain sealed until his court appearance this morning. Penny was initially taken into custody for second-degree manslaughter in Neely's killing, a death that Penny says was an act of self-defense. Now to the latest on the legal trouble surrounding former President Trump. The Republican president frontrunner is again defending his handling of classified material as he hits the campaign trail in New Hampshire. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is here in studio with more. Gabe, good morning. Hi, Joe. Good morning. Well, former President Trump is offering a new defense in that classified documents case, saying it was all bravado and that the papers he showed others were not really classified. It comes as we're hearing more from a whistleblower about the investigation into Hunter Biden. This morning, Donald Trump is insisting that newly surfaced audio recording was illegally leaked and amounts to election interference. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a badge. In the recording obtained by NBC News, the former president is heard discussing with aides and writers working on then-Chief of Staff Mark Meadows' memoir, what appears to be a classified document from General Mark Milley about plans for an attack on Iran. They presented me this. This is off the record, but they presented me this. This was him. This was the Defense Department and him. In the recording from July of 2021, Mr. Trump acknowledges he had not declassified the document. It is like highly confidential yeah. <laughs> secret. This is secret information. Mr. Trump is charged with 37 federal criminal counts related to his handling of classified documents, boxes of them found throughout his Mar-a-Lago estate. He's pleaded not guilty. In a new interview, Mr. Trump saying he had no documents and it was bravado. Also telling Fox News Digital he did nothing wrong. He had a whole desk full of lots of papers and mostly newspaper articles, copies of magazines, copies of different plans, copies of stories. 
It comes as Republicans are hoping to shift the spotlight to Hunter Biden, who reached a plea deal resulting in no prison time, as a whistleblower is coming forward with new allegations, saying the investigation was hindered. There were certain investigative steps that we weren't allowed to take that could have led us to President Biden. IRS supervisory agent Gary Shapley telling CBS News if Hunter Biden were anyone else, things would have been much different. If this was any other person, they likely would have already served their sentence. However, some legal experts have said the tax charges Hunter Biden is pleading guilty to are rarely brought against first-time offenders. Meanwhile, former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney, who lost her seat in Congress to a Trump-backed candidate, telling Lester Holt it's time for her party to move past Trump. It's very clear for the Republican Party, um, you know, th they have to choose. Uh, and the choice is whether or not you support the Constitution or you support Donald Trump. As for the Hunter Biden probe, Attorney General Merrick Garland is expected to face a grilling from House Republicans over the matter in upcoming months, according to two sources familiar with the matter. Now, he has previously denied any interference in the investigation and reached out to the Justice Department over the new whistleblower allegations and have not heard a response yet. All right, Gabe, thank you so much. And we have more now from Lester's exclusive interview with former Wyoming Congresswoman Liz Cheney at the Aspen Ideas Festival. She shared more of her thoughts on the investigation into Trump, the future of the Republican Party, and her future in politics. Here in Colorado, I spoke exclusively with former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney here at the Aspen Ideas Festival, of which the NBC Universal News Group is the media partner. I started off asking her assessment of the indictment against former President Trump over his handling of classified documents. I think that, um, you know, we've seen now uh, with the, the audio tape uh, that, that is out today as well, um, you know, that there's just simply no question that uh, he's unfit to be the president of the United States. And, um, you know, accountability really matters. Accountability uh, for those issues that we've now seen in terms of this indictment over the documents. Um, accountability for what he did on January 6th. After the indictment, you reminded Republicans of something you had said before, and it was you are defending the indefensible. There will come a day when Donald Trump is gone, but your dishonor will remain. I'm wondering if that doesn't ring a bit hollow now, because he has shown incredible strength through all this. Two indictments, continues to lead the field by a wide margin for the re Republican nomination, and appears to get, be getting stronger. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that it, it proves my point. I mean, the, the dishonor of continuing to defend a man who has done what he did. And if the Republican Party continues down this path um, and uh, moves towards, for example, nominating Donald Trump for the presidency, uh, you know, I think that we have seen day after day after day the party go further and further um, uh, down this path of not being salvageable. Do you think he can be reelected? I think that um, he must not be. Uh, I think that nominating him will require, will, will result in the Republican Party splintering, as it should. I tell this to my Democratic friends, and I have more Democratic friends now than I used to. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, it is, um, it's really important for Democrats to take him seriously. You know, there can be a tendency I see sometimes for people on the Democratic side to say, well, look, sure, you know, the Republicans will nominate him, the Republicans are a mess, but, but we'll be able to beat him in a general. And um, that is playing with fire, and it's a, it's a risk we can't take. So Cheney telling me she'll make her decision on if she will run later this year. If you were to run, would it be as a third party candidate? I'm not going to do anything that helps Donald Trump. Hunter Biden, as you know, recently pleaded guilty or is, uh, did a deal with the, the government regarding tax evasion. Many Republicans call it a sweetheart deal and evidence of a two-tier justice system. Do you think we have a two-tier justice system? Look, I think that, um, well, the, the U.S. attorney who was responsible for the Hunter Biden uh, investigation was appointed by Donald Trump. Um, the... Department of Justice in the statement that they issued about the deal said the investigation goes on. I think that the attacks that we're seeing from the Republicans on uh, 
Merrick Garland and on Christopher Wray, um, you know, are um, are unfounded. Our thanks to Lester Holt for that report. You can watch his full interview with former Congresswoman Liz Cheney at NBCNews.com. Coming up on this hour of Morning News Now, we are flipping the script with a comedian whose disability is part of the act. But first, leaving home on the heels of the spike in anti-LGBTQ legislation across the country, we'll take a look at the financial toll this is taking on the transgender community. Those stories and more after this. Millions of people use sites like GoFundMe to raise money for everything from medical bills to classroom supplies. Well, now some members of the LGBTQ community are crowdfunding to help them move out of conservative states. This comes as a record number of anti-LGBTQ laws have been popping up across the country. NBC News correspondent Zinclay Esamwa caught up with members of the queer community who say they faced expensive moves after being pushed out of places they've called home for decades. After more than two decades in Tennessee, Anne and her wife are packing their bags. They're heading west ahead of two anti-trans bills set to go into effect on July 1st. It, it's heartbreaking that the state I love no longer values me or other people like me. Anne is a trans woman. She asked that we not use her full name out of concerns for her safety. What has led you then to move now? I have started seeing the radicalization of... Um, you know, fundamentalists and conservatives, they're showing up at protests, they're harassing people, they're showing up armed places. It, it just doesn't feel as, um, as safe a place to stay. But the cost of finding that safety comes with a high price tag. We cost averaged everything and we came out conservatively at around $10,000. And, and that is a very paralyzing number. So they turned to GoFundMe, and they're not alone. According to GoFundMe, as of June, the number of fundraisers created to support trans people seeking to relocate has gone up more than 100% across states with anti-trans legislation. And in Florida, there's been a 520% increase. The ACLU finding that 46 states have introduced or voted on nearly 500 of these laws during the 2023 session thus far. I, I know about six trans people off the top of my head who are all raising GoFundMes to leave to other states. It's just a direct impact of the laws. In Florida, Thorne and Logan lost access to hormone treatments when the state's SB 254 went into effect in May. It bans all gender-affirming care for trans youth, allows the state to take custody of children who have gotten gender-affirming care, and puts new restrictions on adults seeking this kind of care. Legislation in Florida has directly stripped away any personal medical freedom I have had. They plan to move to Illinois by the end of the summer. But for the Ledoux family... That SB 254 bill passed. It really wasn't an option to wait. It just wasn't safe to, for us to be there anymore. Jade Ledoux is a mother of five, and one of her sons, Kai, is trans. The chance of having your child taken away from you, I think any parent would go in a heartbeat. They moved from Florida to Massachusetts in May. How do you feel about all the bills that Florida has been passing? It's kind of dumb. <laughs> Why do you think it's dumb? Because, like, trans people should be who they want to be. While Ladu says their GoFundMe didn't cover all the costs, she maintains the move was worth it. Do you feel safer? Oh, yeah. Much safer. I always get emotional when I think of this. Driving down the street and just seeing flags and knowing that it's accepted up here is huge. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News. International headlines now. In France, protesters are taking to the streets after a 17-year-old was shot by police near Paris during a traffic stop. We do want to warn you, some of the footage might be a little disturbing for viewers. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Labanga is back with that and other international headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yes, it all happened in a Paris uh, a suburb. Now, this footage shows the uh, police officer pointing the gun at the car moments before he pulls the trigger. Now, the driver was only 17 year old, at least according to a statement translated by NBC News. Now, despite attempts to assist from emergency services, he died of bullet wounds in the chest. The officer could now be facing homicide charges, according to the local prosecutor's office. Protests uh, erupted overnight near the scene, and the French Interior Minister 
Minister tweeted, quote, the General Inspectorate of the National Police has been asked to shed light on the circumstances of this tragedy. Now, this is the second person this year to be killed by police during a routine traffic stop. President Macron spoke out just this morning, calling the incident unexplainable and inexcusable. Now, let's head over to Sierra Leone, where the president was just sworn in for a second term. This comes just hours after his election win. President Maba Bio, represent, presenting Sierra Leone's People's Party, took home nearly 1.6 million votes. But his opponent, Samura Kamara, has a few thoughts of his own. He rejects the results and describes the election as a frontal attack on our fledgling democracy. The vote count came with a series of controversies. Some international observers also spoke out, questioning the integrity of the process. We end now in a little closer to home for me, in Italy, where archaeologists found a painting in the ruins of Pompeii. And guess what? It's a picture of a pizza. Italy's culture minister is calling the flatbread shown in picture a distant ancestor to the modern dish. It was found next to what might have been a bakery. Archaeologists continue to search the ruins of the city of Pompeii, destroyed nearly 2,000 years ago by a volcano. And it looks like the ruined city still has some tasty stories to tell. But if you look at that picture carefully, Joe, there's something that is even more amazing. Uh, well, next to it, there's some yellow fruit that looks like pineapple. And I thought that it was the Americas who invented pineapple on pizza. Well, look at that. That is surprising. I bet it was a debate back then, just like it's a debate right now. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate yep. it. <laughs> Bad behavior by tourists on vacation has been thrown into the spotlight. That's after this viral video of a man appearing to carve his and his girlfriend's names into the wall of the ancient Colosseum in Rome sparked outrage. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa is here with more on that shocking video. Maggie, good morning. Yeah, Joe, good morning. The American tourist who shot that video says he was absolutely flabbergasted by it. He says he has no idea who that guy is or where he's from. But he says regardless of that, whether you're touring ancient Roman ruins or iconic spots here in the States, his take is respect the space and respect the people. Otherwise, you might end up potentially like this guy and also like so many others, unfortunately, in the past, whose in-the-moment stunts produce long-term consequences. An apparent romantic gesture on an ancient Roman canvas. This morning, a recipe for outrage. Shot Friday at Italy's famed capital city, this video appears to show a man using keys to carve into an icon of world history. The Coliseum. Seriously? The man silent but smiling when confronted. <laughs> this freeze frame shows etched into that nearly 2,000 year old wall Ivan plus Haley, 23. Behind the camera, 38 year old yeah, California yeah, yeah. native Ryan Lutz, who had just toured the Coliseum. You see this guy oh. carving into the wall of the Coliseum. What do you think? I mean, I use the term flabbergasted, and I don't use that lightly. I'm upset. I'm angry. Yes. Lutz says he told security, who said they contacted the police, but he says nothing happened. Hours later, Lutz posted the video online, and the outrage was immediate, including from the Italian government. On Twitter, Italy's Minister of Culture calling the carving a sign of great incivility. Past incidents of similar vandalism have produced fines and prison time. Proof, bad tourist behavior is nothing new. Earlier this year, guides in Nepal pleaded with hikers to stop leaving tons of garbage on Mount Everest campsites. If you don't want to pick up your trash, don't come to the mountain. In Hawaii, officials recently launched investigations into swimmers caught on camera harassing dolphins. Bad behavior in nature can also prove dangerous, just like this past incident at Yellowstone National Park, where a group got too close to a bison who charged at them and launched this girl into the air. And in Venice, authorities fined two tourists for water skiing on the city's Grand Canal. The city's mayor calling them imbeciles. Ah! And who could forget this 2013 Ooh. Utah incident when Boy Scout leaders toppled an ancient boulder thought to be 170 million years die. old. Well, the pair told NBC News they were preventing the, the rock from hurting someone and were later sentenced to fines and probation. Seriously? This latest case has Lutz hoping this kind of behavior becomes ancient history. I'd settle for this guy just kind of learning the lesson. Like, don't disrespect home, you know, host countries. Yeah, that's good advice. So despite the video evidence, which you've obviously seen, Italian authorities have yet to ID the man involved. And there are also no specifics at this point on what kind of penalty he might face. But it's worth noting, in 2014, a Russian man carved his initial 
into the Coliseum because apparently people do this. And he was fined at 20,000 euros, the equivalent of roughly 22,000 American dollars. And he was given a four month suspended prison sentence. So it might be a precedent, but it's shocking what, that precedents exist. What are people? This, I, I, I don't know. The word imbecile is actually quite practical. We all chuckled quite, at that word. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, a good one. I it think applies. it works here. All right, Maggie, good to see you. Thank you so much. Sure. Coming up, a new health warning this morning from the CDC, a concerning group of malaria cases discovered in recent weeks. What you need to know about this and how you can protect yourself while still enjoying the outdoors. That's up next. Welcome back. Serious failures by jail staffers led to the 2019 suicide of disgraced sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. That is according to a new report from the Justice Department. Epstein died by suicide at a federal jail in New York City as he awaited trial on sex trafficking charges. The DOJ's Inspector General, Michael Horowitz, found that Epstein was left alone for hours before he died, that he was allowed to have extra linens, which he used in his suicide, and that the jail failed to ensure that he had a cellmate as recommended. During the investigation, the inspector general also found misconduct by 13 Bureau of Prisons employees and recommended charges against six of those workers. As of now, only two of the workers have been charged. Prosecutors say they were sleeping and online shopping instead of doing 30-minute checks on Epstein. Both were able to avoid prison time as part of a plea deal. As we have mentioned suicide, we should say if you or anyone you know is struggling, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Brian Koberger appeared in court yesterday, just days after prosecutors announced they would be seeking the death penalty in the University of Idaho murders case. Koberger is accused of killing the four students and faces four counts of first-degree murder. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin is in Moscow, Idaho, with the latest. Well, Brian Koberger was wearing a dark suit in stark contrast to the orange prison jumpsuit of appearances Past, I was actually in court for the proceedings and watched as he walked into the room with his defense team for a brief second, sort of taking in a scene before sitting down, facing the judge and never looking back. It was clear that he was intently listening to the proceedings, which is what you would expect considering the death penalty is now at stake. The hearing lasted about 27 minutes, and this was all about the defense pushing for more discovery. In this particular hearing, they were asking for three things in particular. Training records of police officers they say are critical to the investigation. FBI cell phone records, as well as an FBI report about that white Hyundai Elantra. The judge granting part of the request, taking the rest into consideration. And what was clear from this hearing is that the defense is dealing with an absolute mountain of discovery. Speaking to legal experts, they say they believe that October 2nd trial date will slide, especially given that this is now a death penalty case. Back to you. All right, Aaron McLaughlin, thank you. Prosecutors have unveiled shocking new evidence in the involuntary manslaughter case against the parents of a teen who shot and killed four classmates in Michigan back in 2021. Prosecutors say James and Jennifer Crumbly bought their son Ethan the gun just days before the shooting and reportedly still had the receipt for the weapon when they were arrested. The prosecution also argued that text messages between the Crumblies prove that they knew their son needed mental health help. The Crumblies have asked the state Supreme Court to drop all the charges against them. They have been in custody since the shooting. Turning now to a health alert as the CDC sounds a warning following five recent cases of malaria. So far, four cases have been treated in Florida and one in Texas. The agency says all five patients are recovering. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has the details. Well, the CDC says this is the first time in 20 years that malaria cases have spread stateside from locally born cases, meaning not brought in from international travel. Now, the good news is officials say that the risk of actually contracting malaria is extremely low. But still, it's a troubling sign as millions of Americans prepare to spend their summer days outside. They are the pesky part of summertime fun. From kids' camps to backyard barbecues, mosquitoes are often the unwanted guest. But this morning, the CDC is sending a warning about mosquito-transmitted malaria cases. It comes after state health officials have identified five locally acquired malaria cases in recent weeks. Four in Florida, one in Texas, all transmitted by mosquito bites. What was different about this is 
These happened domestically, meaning people didn't travel abroad and come to the U.S. and then get diagnosed with malaria. Officials say there is no evidence the cases in the two states are linked. In Florida, all four cases were detected in Sarasota County. Now the entire state is under a mosquito-borne illness advisory. We're really throwing everything we have at the situation right now. Malaria symptoms can be similar to the flu, fever, body aches and chills, as well as headaches and nausea. With an early diagnosis, malaria is treatable with the help of prescription drugs. Now the CDC is urging doctors to be on high alert. We need physicians to understand that they should have some suspicion for malaria. And it's not difficult to diagnose and it's not difficult to treat. The key, officials say, protection. That includes wearing EPA-approved insect repellents, covering up with long sleeves and pants, especially during dawn and dusk when mosquitoes are most active. And getting rid of any standing water where mosquitoes can lay eggs. And about those five malaria patients, the good news is officials say that they've all been treated and their conditions are improving. Now, if you are experiencing any of those symptoms and fear that you may have been infected, the CDC says go see your doctor. Typically, symptoms can start to appear anywhere between 7 and 30 days after a mosquito bite, give or take a few days. But the bottom line is that this is something that is curable if it's treated and diagnosed early. Back to you. All right, Blaine Alexander, thank you so much. Coming up, scroll watch. Some social media giants are rolling out new tools that focus on safety for teens online, and they're getting parents involved too. More on that in a moment. Plus, we are flipping the script this morning with a laugh out loud comedian who's bringing her disability into the spotlight with her side splitting act. We're going to introduce you to Tina Frimmel next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Meta and TikTok are launching new tools aimed at encouraging teen safety on social media, and they're asking mom and dad to get involved, too. Some of the new changes allow parents to see exactly who their children are messaging and even how much time they spend on certain apps. B. Moyes is author and cognitive specialist, joins us now. B, good to have you with us. So I mean, there's a lot of focus really on direct messaging here, parental limits on how many conversations you can have, restrictions on messaging people you don't know, limits on how much time you can spend messaging. Is the biggest worry here strangers or, or is it people that teens already know? I think it's a combination of both. Um, because social media gives you the ability to access anyone and everyone, so you may have the dangers of bullying from people that you may already know through schools or different outlets or activities that, you know, kids are consistently, you know, interacting with. But you also have the dangers of people they do not know. Stranger danger does exist online. So I think it's a combination of both of there's a bullying aspect of people you may know that may use the information in a bad way and people you do not know having access to your child and sending or sharing inappropriate information to them. So be a few of the new tools are things like reminders to take breaks or nudges to stop scrolling at night. We've all ignored these reminders on our phones, just keep extending 15 minutes at a time. So how much weight do these reminders have versus mom or dad or someone just sticking their head in at night and saying, hey, put the phone down. Mom and dad definitely carry more weight when it comes to something like that. We all have reminders that we just ignore. And honestly, after a while, reminders just become background noise. It's just part of the situation that's happening. But, you know, a mom coming in and just kind of saying, hey, it's time to wrap it up or a gentle nudge will definitely change a child's perspective into stopping or actually feeling that they've been on for too long. So, yes, you are the you ha you carry the bigger weight as a parent. They should make a reminder that just has your mom pop up on the screen and start telling you to put the phone down. So, B, in your opinion, are these companies doing enough to protect teens right now, or is this just a start? And you mentioned, you know, gray area. Is there a gray area between the responsibility of the company versus the parent? I, I believe so. I believe this is definitely a good starting point. You know, we've social media has been around quite a while now, so we should have more already implemented, but we do not. But I do applaud them for the attempt. I think definitely the Surgeon's General warning earlier this year has definitely created a buzz around, hey, this is a bigger danger and we need to keep our kids safer. But most importantly, parents also need to be involved and realize that 
you have to be part of the solution. It can't just be led by these companies because that's not what they're necessarily thinking about. So I think it's a combination of both. They're doing what they can now, but parents also need to also be very proactive as well. All right. E. Moyes, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Now to some money news. It's the end of the line, apparently, for Google's high-tech glasses project. CNBC's Silvana Hanau is back with that and other financial headlines. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yeah, that's right. So Google has reportedly killed a project to build its own augmented reality glasses. The company worked on the devices for several years, but Business Insider says it shelved the product following a number of layoffs and reshuffling over the past few months. Now, Google's head of AR and VR also left the company earlier this year. Last year, The Verge reported that Google could launch the glasses in 2024. Now, Google is focusing more on creating Android for AR to license its software to manufacturers. Separately, Google is distancing itself from a planned drag show after some employees signed a petition opposing the Pride event. According to the petition seen by CNBC, those employees claim the performance sexualizes and disrespects Christian co-workers and accuse Google of religious discrimination. Google, which sponsors a series of Pride events each year in San Francisco, says the drag performance is still open to the public, but it's encouraging employees to attend a social gathering at its offices instead. Pepsi is stepping up to the plate with a new cola-infused ketchup at four major league ballparks on the 4th of July. Baseball fans can try the Pepsi ketchup at Yankee Stadium, the Minnesota Twins Target Field, the Detroit Tigers Comerica Park, and the Arizona Diamondbacks Chase Field next Tuesday. Now, if you can't make it there, Pepsi is still offering a deal. From now through the 4th, you can buy hot dogs and Pepsi, text free Pepsi, and upload a receipt for up to $2.59 toward the cost of a 20-ounce Pepsi product. All details are available on Pepsi's website, Joe. Or you can just Cola infused pour ketchup. Pepsi in your ketchup and shake it. I don't know how that mm, would work. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Savannah, <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Now to our series, Flipping the Script, featuring people on screen, on stage, and behind the scenes, shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter comedian Tina Frimmel, who happens to have cerebral palsy and often talks about her experience with the disorder in her stand-up routines. I just kind of thought that because you rock climb, that you can, could carry coffee. You would think, but, uh, no. The, the funny thing about capability and disability, um, it kind of defies logic. Oddly enough, though, the only exception is if the drink has ice in it, like, I could run a marathon. Tina Frimble just wrapped up a tour of the Northeast. She's also appeared on Comedy Central, and we are lucky to have her here on Morning News Now. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. I bet you're already making jokes about the Pepsi-flavored ketchup, oh right? Oh, my God. That <laughs> sounds horrendous. Horrendous. I'm awake now. You're awake. Yeah. Maybe it's because you had some Pepsi-flavored ketchup. That would wake you up in the morning, yeah. right? So, I mean, you with your comedy, you delve into anecdotes about your life, and you're not afraid to delve into heavy your topics too, right? I mean, no. explain to us your comedy style. No, well, well I, I found out quickly that, that comedy was the perfect outlet for talking about the disabled experience. Not a lot of people love hearing about it. It's a, a taboo, heavy, tragic topic. And humor was the kind of spoonful of sugar needed for people to be able to um, hear, hear what the authentic experience that I go through is, all the while not having a panic attack. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had one? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. You, you just wrapped up uh, your tour. It was called Something Very Particular. Yes. What, what was that experience like, and what is the reaction from folks in the audience and people you get to talk to maybe oh after the show? Oh, my gosh. It was incredible. Uh, I, uh, I went ev everywhere from D.C. to Pittsburgh to Boston, and um, just I I'm, still, I'm still grappling with the power of the Internet and the scope that I have, and people would show up in 
glitter sparkles and and crazy shoes and everything for me I, it was just amazing to hear well, well I, I I read all the comments and I see people in masses and yet to really afterwards talk to people hear their story and hear what they get most out of me just being me it's amazing. What does it mean to you to inspire so many people? Weird. <laughs> well, weird. I mean, my goal is always just, even before comedy, just as a person, I, I feel like I, I had such a hard, a hard beginning of my life. I feel like I'm living in the bonus round <laughs> a bit here. And for that reason, naturally, I've always just wanted to brighten people's days, even just for a second. Comedy really is the best job in the world. I read a great comment from you. You say even and every comedian has a show where maybe they bomb or maybe they're not too funny. And you say, well, even if you do, you at least put on a TED Talk, right? <laughs> I can't lose. I can't. <laughs> that is a great way to look at it. Yes, yeah, I found the hack, a life hack. <laughs> when you were younger, my understanding is you were more interested in maybe acting or singing. What was it that made yeah. you say, nope, comedy, that's what I'm going to well, do? Well, you know, the funny, I accidentally, um, I went to college for journalism after I began to give up on my dream with a big actor because there aren't really that many actors acting roles for disabled actors. And um, and comedy, I, I joined a comedy class at the Vermont Comedy Cl Club right after college on a whim. Um, I had been, uh, I'd gotten very much into British comedy panel shows in college. And it was just something I thought maybe you could Past the time while I figure out what I'm doing with my existence. Uh, and here we are. Here we are, and you are bringing joy to so many people. Tina Frimmel, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for coming <laughs> on our show you. and chatting with us. And I know a lot more people are going to be checking you out after this. Thanks. Tina, thank, thank you so much. All right, and by the way, she's going to be touring the West Coast during the month of September. So if you're there, Check out Tina. Coming up, all you Wheel of Fortune fans out there, you don't need to speculate any longer on who is going to succeed the legendary Pat Sajak. As host of one of America's most watched game shows, we've got the big reveal right after this. A new Superman and Lois Lane have been cast ahead of the Man of Steel's next movie. David Sweat will be putting on the famous cape, taking over from Henry Cavill, Christopher Reeve, and many others over the years. You may have seen him in the Netflix show The Politician, but this will actually be his first major leading role in a major studio film. Emmy winner Rachel Brosnahan will be playing Lois Lane. Of course, she's best known as the star of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Superman Legacy is directed by James Gunn and is due to be released in 2025. We're going to end this hour with the start of a new game show era just two weeks after longtime Wheel of Fortune host Pat Sajak announced he'd be retiring. Retirement that's still about a year away. We already know his replacement. And it is a very familiar face, someone who has been on our TV screens for 20 plus years. <laughs> It did not take long for Wheel of Fortune to solve this puzzle. Hey, everybody, thank you. When longtime host Pat Sajak steps down at the end of next season, Ryan Seacrest will become the new master of ceremonies for the syndicated game show. Well, the announcement was made Tuesday, just two weeks after Sajak's retirement news. Seacrest said in a statement, I'm truly humbled to be stepping into the footsteps of the legendary Pat Sajak, adding, I can't wait to continue the tradition of spinning the wheel and working alongside the great Vanna White. Goodbye. Many fans wondered if White would be the one taking the wheel of the popular game show or Sajak's daughter Maggie. Even Whoopi Goldberg expressed interest on The View. I want that job. Well, now we, oh, we figured it out. Oh, Fortune is one of the most watched game shows in history, now averaging more than 9 million viewers a night 
according to Sony Pictures Television. Man, it's our 40th season. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. My name is Pat Sajak. Sajak first took the reins from host Chuck Woolery in 1981 and helped catapult Wheel into the longest-running syndicated game show of all time. Sajak has won three daytime Emmys for Outstanding Game Show Host, but his successor's resume is pretty impressive, too. Seacrest's career spans more than two decades. Try this one. Is it Peach or is it Bob? No, I can't. Yeah, yeah. Hosting live with Kelly and Ryan to his nationally syndicated Problem. radio program. Problem. Ariana hey. Grande in the flesh. Yeah. I'm dim the to his 21 seasons as MC of the groundbreaking singing competition American Idol. He even took over for another legend, Dick Clark, as the host of New Year's Rockin' E. Seacrest now adding to his full plate as the Wheel of Fortune spin master. In addition to serving as host, Seacrest will also serve as a consulting producer on Wheel of Fortune. The show's next season is set to begin airing in September, and Seacrest says he plans to learn as much as he can from Sajak in the interim. Here's an interesting note. Seacrest is 48 years old, which means he was just six when Sajak first took over as host. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.